Most people take their fridges for granted, but life would be very different without them. <clears throat> Probably the earliest record of artificial cooling comes from ancient Egypt, where there are records of slaves being employed to fan earthenware pots. That was the same idea as this, the earthenware milk cooler. You put water in the uh, dish down below, and that keeps this cover wet, and it's the evaporation of the water that cools the milk inside. The other method of cooling things, used extensively in ancient Rome, was simply to collect snow. Using a bit of insulation, it can last a surprisingly long time without melting. Romans not only cooled their wine, but they also made ice cream. By the 19th century, various other liquids had been discovered that evaporated much faster than water, like alcohol. If I dab some on my hand, the cooling effect is quite noticeable. It's evaporating so fast, my hand's almost dry already. And this produces even more rapid evaporation. It had been discovered that various gases, when they're compressed, can condense into liquids. And in fact, the, this is carbon dioxide in the cylinder, and under pressure, it's actually a liquid at room temperature. If I uh, re open the valve, it'll shoot out of this pipe and evaporate very rapidly back to a gas, and the cooling effect is quite dramatic. You can see the black pipe has now gone all white because it's covered in frost. If this gas was collected and compressed again, it could be condensed back to a liquid and a sort of cycle could be established. And this is exactly the principle of the modern fridge. The liquid under pressure escapes through the restriction valve. As it evaporates to a gas, the pipes get very cold. The gas is piped back to a pump where it gets compressed and heated. The hot gas then cools and condenses back to a liquid, still under pressure. The cycle then starts all over again. The first patent for a machine like this was granted in 1834 to Jacob Perkins. At the time, Perkins' invention was not greeted with much interest because there was already a well-established natural ice industry. Ice was cut from the lakes in America on a vast scale. By 1890, it was harvesting 25 million tonnes a year. Britain imported over half a million tonnes, partly from America and partly from Norway. It was stored in giant wooden ice houses where it could last all summer. This ice was delivered about twice a week by the icemen. They put it into these uh, domestic ice boxes. <clears throat> the ice went in the top and the food goes in the bottom. The ice slowly melted and ended up in a drip tray which had to be emptied every day or two. Well, the natural ice industry was well established in Europe and in America, but in Australia, the winters weren't really cold enough to produce much ice. In 1837, James Harrison emigrated from Glasgow to Australia. He became a journalist, but his real obsession was refrigeration. Oh dear, I cannot concentrate, it's too hot. If only I had a wee machine to make ice. Aye. His first machine didn't work, which he blamed on inferior colonial workmanship. He then went to England and persuaded a Dr. Seabee to make one, based on Perkins' design. 
By 1858, Harrison had brought Seabee's machine back to Australia. Here's my machine, and here you see a perfect lump of ice. Oh. Oh. Right, there's a flywheel here, right? Make sure it's well adjusted. Harrison was then commissioned by a brewery to build a commercial refrigeration plant. So cooling Australian lager was the first practical use of an artificial refrigeration machine in the world. Ice factories soon opened up in England in competition with the natural ice warehouses. The Lowestoft Ice Company was one of the first, as David Forster remembers. The ice company originally began in 1898, and it was my great-grandfather, Mr W.F. Cockrell, who decided that ordinary ice from the glaciers, the Norwegian glaciers, uh, wasn't sufficient for good quality ice, so he decided to make artificial ice using ammonia refrigerant, which happened to come on the market in the 1870s, 1890s. Water is placed in the ice moulds, which are then lowered into the giant brine tank. The circulating brine is cooled by pipes full of the ammonia refrigerant to about minus 10 degrees centigrade. The brine tank is vast, the size of a public swimming pool. After a few days, the water in the moulds has fully frozen and is ready for use. To extract the ice, the moulds are first transferred to a bath of warm water to loosen them. Although this process looks very impressive, today there are much quicker and cheaper methods of making ice. Block ice is now really obsolete, and this is actually the last lift. It's rather sad to see the last lift. And it's on the floor there. These are the last blocks that are ever These are the last blocks, the actually, the, the very last blocks. It's a very old-fashioned way of making ice, and it's not really very viable nowadays. This is the engine room of the ice factory and it's uh, basically a